Hello, folks. Guy Adami here with my, you know what who he is, my dear friend Dan Nathan at Risk Reversal. Another episode of the Macro Setup. It is Tuesday, December 1st, Tuesday, December 1st, Dan. And this Macro Setup, of course, is brought to you by Nadex, the premier U.S. exchange for binary options, call spreads, and knockouts. Dan, it's been an amazing couple weeks. How are you today? I'm doing great, Guy. Great to be with you here. Um, we got the last month of the year. It's been really, I think, on so many levels, obviously unprecedented. We're here to talk about markets. And I, I just can't, if you think back seven or eight months and, and the health crisis and the economic crisis that was in front of us and what the markets were pricing at the time, the fact that we are literally trading within a whisper of all-time highs in the S&P 500, in the NASDAQ, um, it's truly shocking. I think the NASDAQ's up more than 30% of the year. The S&P's up uh, more than 12% on the year. And it just goes to show you that um, when we throw everything at the financial markets, how do you bet against them? Is, is, that, yeah. is that the lesson of 2020, Guy? It's not only the lesson of 2020, it's the lesson period and it's a lesson for whatever reason that i haven't been able to wrap my head around because you know i've been one of these people of the belief that at a certain point you know, just throwing money at the problem or throwing money at the market the, at a certain point the market's going to call bs on you and i've been i've been 100 percent wrong there have been periods of time where it looked like things were going to sort of fall apart and the fed wasn't gonna be able to bail things out but you know you just said it when you go from a three and a half trillion dollar balance sheet, I think yeah. October, November of 2018 to a now north of seven trillion dollar balance sheet. I mean, I guess invariably this is what happens with with risk assets and markets. And here we are to your point, Russell all time high, Nasdaq all time high, S&P 500 all time high. It makes sense when you boil it down to that simplistic of an equation, Dan. Yeah, I guess what's really different for me when I think back to the last 20 years, we've had three uh, major market crashes, which were obviously commensurate with economic recessions. And I think that, you know, I was a very young trader back in 2000. Um, but, you know, the bear market that happened after the dot-com crash, after 9-11, there was a lot of corporate malfeasance. There was a lot of things going on um, at the time. But, you know, from the highs in March of 2000 to the lows of October 2002, that was an excruciatingly long bear market. And then flash forward to the next crash that we saw when the S&P 500 topped out in November of 2007, didn't bottom until March, April of 2009. Again, you know, a very long protracted bear market. This time around, we had the S&P 500 top out on February 20, uh, 20th. We mm -hmm. had it bottom out down 35% on March 23rd and was making new highs by some point in the summer. And here we are on, on what feels like a runaway breakout from those prior highs. So I guess the point is, is that, yes, if you throw multiple trillions of dollars, leave interest rates at zero and speak to the fact that they're going to be there for a very long time, there's no other thing that can happen than risk assets inflate, right? And, and that's just, I guess, the lesson that we've learned over the last 20 years. And oh, by the way, I think obviously the market, it's for whatever reason, and, and it's sort of mystery to me, but I think they love the fact that Janet Yellen is going to be in Treasury. I guess they, they view that as a good thing, given her past and given some of her policies and some of her uh, ideas on things. I think we'll talk about it, but there's some hope that some sort of skinny stimulus deal gets done. I think the market's taking its cues from that. You have another Monday yesterday of more vaccine news. It seems four Mondays in a row we've had positive vaccine news. You also have, I, I think, um, to your point, month end yesterday, you know, new yeah. month today, money flows. So there are all the kinds of things that speak to why the market's higher. But the question is, you know, should it maintain these levels and are we going to stand here? And I think as the traders that are watching this, those are the answers that we're going to try. Those are the questions that we're going to try to answer. I will say, just in terms of um, metrics, the one metric we bring up a lot and the one metric that I look at because it's the one that Warren Buffett seems to look at the most is the fact that now market cap of the S&P 500 is 180 percent of GDP. And I will tell you that that denominator is not getting bigger anytime soon to flatten that out. And that numerator seems to go up and up. So, you know, what was 140 percent, people thought it was ridiculous, is now 180 percent. And the question is, at what point does the market sort of call its bluff? And I got to tell you, Dan, 
given everything that I'm looking at, given the VIX at the levels that we last saw back in February, we'll look at that chart. It stands to reason that we're getting really frothy here. Yeah, so let's look at those charts. You know, the S&P 500, um, you know, we've seen this massive rotation, right, out of growth and into uh, value, value cyclicals, um, the sorts of uh, sectors that have massively uh, underperformed that um, really got hit hard by the, the pandemic here and that investors expect to see some sort of rotation into. Here's the one year of the S&P 500. You draw a line from that February high. You attach it to that September mm -hmm. 2nd high. You hit that early November high right after the Pfizer um, vaccine news. And here we are with a gap up today, like you said, on, on potential for that skinny um, stimulus package. We're buttoned up right against that. That's kind of interesting level here to me. Um, let's see if we can get through there. I'll just mention that the S&P 500 is 14% above its 200-day moving average. It has not been that far above the moving average in a very long time. It usually coincides when the market is at an all-time high. And, you know, I can see a pullback to that 200, or excuse me, if you look at that green line, that is that 100-day moving average. That's about 3,600 here. And that would set up pretty nicely. Listen, if you're looking for a better 2021 in stocks based on the discounting of the pandemic being over at some point um, and the economy fully reopening, you do not want to see December really repeat um, what we saw in November unless you're in it for the short term. That is not a sustainable thing um, for the market to build on. But if you were to build further build on this base between 3,400 and 3,600, then that sets up for a little bit of a discounting of some good news, which really could power us into, let's say, Q2 is really what you want to see happening if you want to build on what you would say this base is in the S&P 500 right here. Yeah, and I think people, and you've spoken about this as well in terms of, you know, the rotation, and you were talking about this months ago, by the way, Dan, the rotation yeah. is actually a really healthy thing for yeah. broader markets. You know, you're taking leadership away from one group and bringing it to the next. And as long as that one group doesn't fall out of bed, and we're obviously going to talk about your F mega complex in the NASDAQ, <laughs> and it hasn't fallen out of bed by any stretch. As a matter of fact, that's testing all-time highs as well. It's a really healthy combination and a healthy brew for this rotation into, obviously, the, the, some of these value names that we've been talking about. I will look at this chart and say, to your point, you know, when, when you're that far away from moving averages, to your point, the 100-day comes in around 3,400. Here we are at almost 3,700 or thereabout. At a certain point, you're going to get it back and fill. And I think we're precariously close to that point. And by all looks of things in terms of where the VIX is and where the move in the S&P is, you know, you're looking at probably what a lot of people would consider I don't want to say a textbook blow off top, but, it, but a short term blow off top at least. So I look at this chart. You drew the line. We're right up against that level. By the way, if you were to draw an uptrend line from the March low and connect that recent September low, I think you're going to see that you have this pennant formation. Yeah. And at a certain point, you're going to test the down portion or the, the uptrend of this pennant. And that probably comes in, by the way, right around that 3,400 level, which you flagged in terms of the 100-day moving average, Dan. Yeah, let's quickly look at the three-month chart here to kind of give us a sense of the levels. You know, support right now is that September 2nd blow-off sort of high um, in a way. And so I think that traders might get a bit more defensive below that kind of 3,600 level because you look down and you see 3,400 than 3,300. Um, I want to talk about that rotation real quickly. Um, after that three-month chart, we have um, the three-month of the S&P equal weight. And what does that mean? That means that it's kind of smoothing out the weight of the FMAGA complex. That's Facebook, Microsoft, Apple, Google, and Amazon that make up almost 24% of the S&P 500 um, on, a, on a market cap weighted. But look at the equal weight, the massive outperformance that you saw. What did we see? We saw banks, we saw energy, we saw industrials really um, rip in the last month since the election. So um, that's up about 14% versus the S&P up 11 or 12 percent. Um, there's that outperformance here. Let's go to your VIX. You've been tracking this and you've been all over this over the last few months. We had that move to 40. You thought that would be very short lived. There was very few things in your purview that you could see um, where, you know, aside from civil war after the election, uh, where the VIX would be going much higher. Here we are now, right back to that 20 level. That was the gap level in February when things got real with the, with the pandemic and the S&P sort of uh, turned over. What's your take on the VIX? Was it telling you here at 20? Is it instructing you anything with the S&P 500? 
Well, I, you know, first of all, I didn't think we'd get down to 20, number one. I did think 40 was going to be a short-term top, and we talked, yeah. you know, given anarchy or, to your point, civil war, we were going to probably see 29 really quickly in the VIX post-election, and that happened. But this move from basically 29 down to 20 has clearly caught me off guard, and what it speaks to to me is just this renewed complacency that the market had, oh, by the way, this time last year, think about it. Literally, this time last year is when everybody was lulled in this false sense of security about the market, about the VIX. Market can never go lower. And obviously, you saw what happened in March. I understand that it was one of those once in a lifetime events. But, you know, in terms of setups, in terms of valuation, in terms of the different metrics we look at, market's in the exact same place, actually, probably more extended than it was back then. So I say to myself, a VIX at 20 has been support, you know, prior resistance become support. And here we are. And you drew the line right around this yeah. 20 level. So to the extent that you want to use it as a barometer and then say, okay, the VIX is at 20. We're probably overextended in the S&P 500. What can I put on in terms of trades? I think this really gives you a snapshot as to what is tradable over the next couple of weeks. And when I say tradable, I say, you know, look at things from the short side in terms of indices and yeah. in terms of maybe even some individual names. Yeah, I, it, you know what it says to me, and and we're speaking to the Nadex audience, which is pretty familiar with the use of, of options and spreads and knockouts. Um, it really sets up some pretty good risk reward trades too. It could be defensive, whether you're using indexes to kind of hedge your portfolio. Um, it just means with the VIX at twenty versus forty um, a month ago that options premiums are much cheaper um, on a directional basis. So whether you're looking to lever um, a long or a short or hedge a portfolio or kind of risk what you're willing to lose, um, it's probably as good a time as it's been since January um, to do that. Um, so let's let's go to the NASDAQ. You know, we talk a lot. I just mentioned those top five names. You know, we know that Tesla is the, going to be the top six name in the S&P 500, topping a $500 billion market cap. Um, the NASDAQ has shown relative underperformance over the last few months, the S&P 500, largely because the concentration in those top five or six names that make up 50% of the weight of the NASDAQ 100. Here we are now getting up to those September 2nd highs. Apple is really powering the way over the last week, especially as Microsoft and Amazon can continue to just consolidate a little bit, but Apple back above that $2 trillion market cap. The NDX, nice base here, um, no doubt about it, but it's failed on two or three times over the last few months at these levels. Does it get through here, Guy, or do you want to see further consolidation? And then here's the last point I'll just make about this. You know, we know that the DOJ and the Justice Department, the FTC, they're, they're kind of circling the wagons around these major tech companies. We saw, interestingly, Facebook just made a billion dollar acquisition. I didn't think that was on the cards. We're seeing Salesforce um, is going to buy uh, 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 Slack uh, in a $24, 25000000000 billion dollar deal, or at least it's rumored. I don't know if that announcement's out yet. So we're starting to see consolidation. These are the very things that the Fed is kind of worried about. Um, do you see a Biden administration kind of clamping down early, kind of flexing a little bit and kind of demonstrating what they are willing to put up with going forward with these tech behemoths? It's interesting, I think, and I think you bring up a great point. I would submit that even if the Biden administration came in and tried to strong arm the tech names, it hasn't seemed to matter. I mean, think about yeah. all the negative headlines in terms of exactly what you just described mm -hmm. over the last year, and the market has absolutely shrugged it off, almost laughed at it and scoffed at it, and we've really never seen a huge downdraft in any of these names, specifically vis-a-vis -vis regulation or vis-a-vis -vis coming in front of uh, Congress and the Senate. So I don't necessarily know that that's a headwind. What I will tell you is, and you said, you know, what do you think here? i tell you the risk reward really sets up well. So at least you know what you're risking if you're betting on a return, sort of a back and fill, as we say in the trading world. You know what the prior high was back basically, in, I think it was late August, early September. You see where we are now. Uh, you don't really necessarily have to make that bet. The bet's been made for you. So I would say Textbook double top, we probably do a back and fill. Do we get back down to that 11,400 level? I would submit probably yes, but let the market dictate that. Yeah. So again, if you were to put on a position here vis-a-vis -vis options or anything else, you know what you're risking. You're risking a close above that prior high, and then you probably stop yourself out, or you start to add to it or lever into a position 
And we've seen it before, Dan. You know firsthand. We've seen the move from August into September, then from September into recently down to that eleven thousand level, and then here we are again. So, yeah. you know, the market the market definitely uh, has a way of repeating itself, and I think we're right back at levels where we're going to fail. Well, let's look at that three month chart of the index real quickly because that's really what we're talking about here, guy. You know, you're just below twelve thousand five hundred. That would be the breakout from those early September highs. We have this nice little. Um, uptrend that's been in place over the last month or so, you have the levels there. I mean, if you're looking to play for a breakout, you stop it at that uptrend, right, that we've had over the last month to the downside, and you might get a runaway breakout. I want to make a couple points, though. Over the next couple of weeks, you know, you see what's going on right now. Um, you know, Tesla's up 5%. Um, it's trading, you know, very near all-time highs here. It's going into the S&P 500. It is a feeding frenzy for this stock. Shorts are covering. Indexers are getting long. There's going to be some funky action into triple witching on December 18th when that um, ad is going to happen or it's going to officially happen on Monday the 24th. Another point right now, as we're talking Tuesday, shortly after the opening, Zoom just reported an amazing quarter and gave really good guidance. Yet the stock is down 12 and a half percent or 12 percent or so down 30 percent from its all time highs made in October. Keep an eye on names like this that were really expensive, that were winners of the pandemic. Um, you could see a bit of an unwind or a further unwind in these things. Um, and that really just speaks to a little bit about sentiment and where money might start flowing um, as it comes out of speculative things. And I'll throw Tesla right in there. So the next few weeks, I'm expecting some major volatility um, in the tech space. Let's move to um, an area, Guy, which is your expertise or mm -hmm. has been your expertise um, in the commodity trading pits back in the 80s when you were just kind of cutting your teeth on uh, black gold here. Let's talk about crude. We have this OPEC plus meeting um, a little bit. Um, and we have a couple charts too, but I'd love to hear what you think might happen um, with this meeting with potential cuts, that sort of thing, what it means for the price and what are some good trading setups here in crude? You know, it's obviously this chart is extraordinarily skewed. It's not your fault, but it's skewed obviously vis-a-vis <laughs> yeah. -vis that huge negative price action that we saw in the front month. So it looks like we've had flat price action. But in essence, you know, crude has been somewhat volatile. And the levels that we find ourselves at now at is effectively where we failed again back in February, March. You see the repeating theme here, folks. And a lot of yep. things have reverted back to the mean in terms of where we are seven, eight, nine, <laughs> effectively nine months ago. So I think we fail here. And again, what I will tell you is if you watch Fast Money, you know, we've talked about some of these levered oil names being plays. I think those trades, and I'm not suggesting they're any easy trades by any stretch, but the easy part of it, the, the beta part of it is probably over. And even in the big cap integrated names where you have huge double bottoms and like an Exxon <clears throat> Mobil from 31 traded up to 41 recently, I think those are in large part over. So I think although the market might be anticipating cuts, I think we've seen before that OPEC can surprise you the other way as well. So if you've enjoyed the crude trade, both the commodity and the underlying uh, securities, I think that's getting long in the tooth now. And now you're just sort of flipping a coin. My instinct here is to be taking money off the table and to be looking to play this from the short side and send it alongside, Dan. Yeah, so let's go to the three month chart of the crude oil. Um, you know, and you look at that breakout above, I don't know, 4350 or so. Um, and you see that little flag forming right there. And, and I would just say, if you're predisposed to be long, if you think that there is, um, you know, further squeezy action on, um, listen, it, it's really, if you look at what's gone on with crude, it's, it's really the Russell, it's all the underperformance. It's, you know, it's this rotation trade for growth in 2021. I think you, you stop it somewhere just below that 44, that breakout level, and you kind of play for a massive nine month, um, breakout, um, if you are on the side that things are going to go well with this vaccine and that growth is going to kind of get back to pre-pandemic levels at some point in mid-2021 because we know that markets start to discount all of that. Let's go to gold here, man. This is one that I think is, is one of the most fascinating charts in this market right here. Um, look at that bounce we had um, today or yesterday into today, the follow through and look where it bounced from. It bounced right at that breakout level from kind of early uh, July, late June or so. I mean, to the penny, as our main man Carter 
worth likes to say. This is why we lean on the charts a good bit. What's your fundamental take here? Obviously, it was a rip-roaring trade in July and August. It's been in a steady downtrend, but it bounced right where you expect it to. What do you do here with gold? Yeah, my fundamental take has not changed. Um, I still think gold is absolutely in play. But what I'll tell you is, much like the VIX, much like some of the broader markets, I did not see gold trading down to these levels. I thought, you know, that we I thought we had found support, to be honest with you, back in September. And I thought that bounce that we did see was going to last. Obviously, it didn't. And here we are. With that said, to the penny, as CBW says, and that's what's exactly happened. And Again, I think this bounce is going to be a sustainable one, and I'm of the belief that the dollar is going to continue to fail. City put a note out a couple of weeks ago that they saw 20% declines in the dollar potentially in 2021. I agree with that, and we'll speak about the dollar in a minute, but I don't think the fundamental the fundamentals of the gold trade have changed at all. As a matter of fact, I think they've only gotten better. We mentioned the fact that the Fed's balance sheet in two years has gone from $3.5 trillion to $7 trillion. You've seen central banks around the world uh, basically in a race to devalue their currency. And I think gold wins to this. Now, the next question is, well, wait a second. If that's the fact, why is gold traded as poorly as it has? And I think a couple of different reasons. I think the fact that the equity market's gotten back on its feet has been somewhat deleterious to the price of gold. And oh, by the way, and we're going to talk about this as well, Bitcoin going from 12500 to 20000 almost in a straight line has probably taken some of the steam out of gold. Whether or not that's justified or not is not really relevant, I guess, because I don't think it is. But I think there is some um, causality there, Dan. Yeah, let's go. We have a one-month chart of gold, and you see um, you know, today's bounce here. You look at that downtrend from the, um, you know, the, I guess it was, yeah, it was November 9th. That was the day that the market just started ripping on the Pfizer vaccine news. And you saw what happened to gold. It went straight from, I don't know, 1970 straight to 1850 um, in, in a day. That was a massive, massive move. Here we are up against that one month downtrend here about 1820 you get through that you probably have a move right back to 1900 but if you are bearish of gold you kind of lean in on that trend line a little bit right and you play for um, a kind of retest of yesterday's low yeah. um, so i just think that's a pretty interesting level you mentioned bitcoin look at this one month chart um, that we have right here and it really doesn't speak to that um, that massive move off of that 12,000 level that you just spoke to. But in one month, it's gone from basically below 16,000 to a new all-time high above 20. But look at what's going on here just today, down a few percent. We got to that new high in the last 24 hours, and it quickly reversed. There's profit taking there, um, but then money flowed back into gold. Um, you know, listen, Bitcoin was the kind of digital gold where they were supposed to be fairly well correlated, especially when Bitcoin's market cap was much smaller. And, and gold is still obviously a behemoth when you think of it um, globally. Um, but the bull case or one of the bull cases for Bitcoin is that if it were to take the mantle of what gold represented in a lot of portfolios institutionally and retail alike, um, it could be much bigger than it is right now. Um, okay, we'll move on from that here. But we have this five-year chart, which I think a lot of macro people in Bitcoin are looking at here on a log basis. And you see, you know, that 2017 high around 20,000. You see where we are right now. And, you know, if you are, again, you used that term before, back and fill, you'd love to see this thing back and fill between 18 or 17,500 and 20,000 and play for a massive breakout at some point next year. The problem with Bitcoin is it, it all happens you know, so fast, right? And it's not, it's not one of those things that it's kind of easy to start positioning in, especially because some of the liquidity issues and the way it moves. Yeah, and I'm not suggesting, I don't think you are either, to be start speculating in Bitcoin. I'm not necessarily no. sure that's what you know, the people watching this video are looking to do. But, but what I will tell you is, much like the VIX, I think it's a great gauge as to what's going on. And oh, by the way, we had Brian Kelly on a couple of weeks ago, and he actually, I don't think there's anybody that's more ardent supporter of cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin, but he actually was waving the caution flag as well, speaking to exactly these levels and probably some of the froth that's gotten in the market. The fact that, you know, now CNBC is putting up the, the Bitcoin bug or whatever we call it. I'm not sure what that is in, in terms of a graphic. And the fact that seemingly every other tweet that I see on my feed has something to do with cryptocurrency is probably suggestive at a near-term 
top. And for you armchair technicians out there, Dan mentioned somewhere between 16,000 and 17,500. I'd go as far to say as a 50% correction of the recent low, which basically was 3,000 up to current levels. You probably are looking at 11,500 or so. And you say, there's no way we're going to see that again. And I'd be like, okay, well, I'll tell you the volatility in Bitcoin is probably quadruple of what the, um, the volatility in the S&P 500. And you absolutely can see it. And oh, by the way, you'd absolutely still be in a very significant bull market. So I think you should have this up just to sort of gauge what's going on with some of the other markets and, and participants in those markets, Dan. Yeah, I think you make a great point as, as a purely a sentiment indicator. Um, you know, the VIX is just an index that tracks the volatility of the S&P 500 um, components um, of, of options pricing. You know, Bitcoin is actually something that people are putting money to, right? And you're seeing those sentiment shifts. So that's why we talk about that. All right, let's talk about the dollar here. You've been all over this one. You've saying lower, lower, lower. You mentioned the Citigroup. Um, no, they see 20% downside. We have a one-year chart right here. We know what that September 2nd low was. It was just below 92. Here we are today um, above that. We did have um, a couple kind of you know, rallies over the last few months that kind of made some people think that maybe we break that downtrend from the March highs it has not been the case. We're below 92 for the Dixie. Um, you know, where do you think we're going in the near term here? And then we have a three month chart that can kind of speak to some of those near term trading levels. Look, I, I, I'll, I think since we started and I've said it on Fast Money, I've said it on um, the Nadex um, podcast, the IG podcast. I'm of the firm belief that the dollar continues to trend lower and any rally, you know, any um, flight to quality rally that we've seen. And oh, by the way, we've seen them before. We obviously saw it in March. We've seen it a couple times since then. Any flight to quality in the form of the U.S. dollar is going to be short lived. And by the way, it's becoming shorter and shorter lived. And these rallies are becoming um, less vociferous and less vociferous, vociferous, if I can use that word. And I do think we take out those previous lows. And I'm in the city camp. You know, I do think in 2021, you could see the dollar significantly lower. Now, a lot of people will say that's going to be extraordinarily bullish for U.S. equities. And I understand that argument. But at a certain point, it ceases to become bullish for U.S. equities. And I think I, I think a steep sell-off in the dollar is going to provide headwinds for a number of different things. I think it's going to really give you some tailwinds for gold. I mean, that's obvious. Uh, but I think in terms of equities, I think people would say, wait a second, we're seeing weakness in the dollar. Um, that, to me, is inflation that nobody wants to talk about. And you talk about macro setups. You know, the Fed talks about a lack of inflation. There's inflation in all the places they don't measure. And, oh, by the way, a falling dollar is inflationary because your buying power is diminished. So there are a number of reasons why I'm bearish at dollar. I think they all make sense. And I think if you're trading the dollar, you look for any bounce as an opportunity to sell it again. And I do think we see this thing in the mid-80s in terms of the DXY. Yeah, so on that three-month chart in the DXY, I just kind of draw a little downtrend from um, that, uh, that high near 93.50 just from um, a couple uh, weeks ago here. And, you know, move back to 92.50 would be probably the level to kind of lay out shorts. If you're in the pressing um, shorts here, you know, we're below that one month level here. Um, you know, 91.50 was that low yesterday. Maybe we press through that, but just kind of keep your tight stop. Um, and, and, you know, again, you know, we, you draw lines however you want. You could look over the last week. You could draw a trend line that gets you to 92, which might be a good stop for any shorts that you're placing right here. You want to keep it tight and you want to be persistent. You know, the flip side of this, you know, we know that the euro makes up about 50% of the U.S. dollar index. So let's look at the euro. We have a three-month chart here, Guy. Um, this thing, no matter what ticker you'd put on that chart, you'd say that's a really bullish uptrend. We see where that resistance is um, on a three month level here going back to early September, you know, 120 looks like a great breakout level here. Um, what do you do with the euro here? I, I suspect you're going to say, well, if I don't like the dollar, then I like the euro here. <laughs> and I think, again, this I, to your point, much like the DXY, you don't have to necessarily have a view. Let the charts Make yeah. take the view for you. Again, you know where I stand. I think the dollar weakens. I think this probably blows through that 120 level. But 
you know, if you have the belief that here we're up against the past resistance, we're going to fail. There's nothing wrong with putting on a position uh, that sort of illustrates that and captures that. And then look for a play back to the trend line. The trend line probably comes in around 119.20 or so. So you have something you can trade against. Yep. I'm taking the macro view that the dollar is going to weaken and you're going to see a blow through this 120 level. And I think we had Peter Hanks on from Daily FX that was speaking about this as well. But, you know, sometimes you can have a view, but they, okay, let the chart um, either back it up or let's trade against levels. And in this case, Dan, you're trading against those, you, again, that prior high back, and I think it was on September 1st, and the yep. levels that we find ourselves at now. Yeah, on a one-year chart, you look at that uptrend, though, from the May kind of lows, and you see to yourself, okay, you know, a retest to 118 could be in the cards. If you're putting shorts on, that might be a good level um, to kind of consider taking it off. And then maybe if you're bullish and, and, and you just want to kind of be a little bit patient here, that could be a good entry point on the long side for a retest of that 120. Let's go to the British pound here. We have a one-year chart. This is one I think Peter was also talking about last week. Um, this is a really interesting chart here when you think about that 135 high mm -hmm. in December. We kind of got back up to it in early September, failed again, big double top, but slowly we kind of bounced off that uptrend from the June lows here, and it looks like it's trying to retake that 135 level or at least we test it um we know that there's some kind of you know another month in some of this brexit conversations any good news there you probably have the the pound breaking out above 135 and then um you know i'll let you speak to it let's go to the three month chart really quickly because look at this little trading level between 134 and 135 and then that uptrend there's a lot to play with here as far as using stops and picking levels a lot to play with in terms of levels without question. And a lot of people will say, and I don't know if we can go back to that prior chart, but a lot of people yeah. will say there are no triple tops. And, you know, maybe that's the case, but obviously you see where we traded to in December of last year. You see yep. where we topped out late August, early September of this year, and you see where we are now. So, you know, you start to test that 135, I think 10 level, 135, 15 level, which is still, you know, a bit away, you have to ask yourself, are we going to be in a new trading range? And I would submit the answer is yes. But again, you don't have to make that decision. Let the chart make it for you. And Dan showed you that trend line from the summer. You could also draw a trend line from the March low and connect some of the lows and you'll see where we potentially trade down to as well. So, you know, this to me, if you're into binary options, man, this sets up really well in terms of levels and the levels are right there for you folks. You know, 135 on the upside, you know, that's sort of one, probably 132 and change level in terms of support. And you can do the math and you can do, you can sort of, you can orchestrate or formulate a trade based on the levels that we just put out there for you. All right, let's wrap it up here. And I just want to kind of go back to some of the things we talked about in the beginning, you know, that was more equity market centric, but we've hit a lot of different risk assets. And I kind of think they speak to this overall notion that obviously, you know, Risk assets were inflated this year, no doubt about it. We also had, you know, a lot of easy monetary policy that was actually meant to kind of keep our economy afloat, right? So the risk asset thing is kind of somewhat of a byproduct of that. This was kind of the, the perfect black swan in a way, obviously, um, COVID-19, that is. And, and you can make the argument, aside from, you know, crazy valuations and maybe some stocks and Bitcoin going from 10,000 to 20,000, and there's a whole host of other examples we could kind of use of kind of bubblicious kind of behavior in, in risk markets, um, you know, that's where we are right now. So I, you know, I just caution the fact that we have one month to the end of this year here. Um, there's lots of asset bubbles that, you know, they can keep inflating, right? Like, like this electric vehicle bubble, it is a bubble. You know, we use the term bubble a lot. It doesn't mean that we're calling a top or calling BS on this or whatever, but you know, I, you know, I mentioned zoom before that was a pandemic bubble, right? Their, their sales in the quarter that just reported were up 355% year over year um, on a big number, you know? So um, I, I guess the point that I'm just making is that these bubbles can continue to inflate. They can continue to be um, irrational, um, you know? Um, but it's really important, I think, from a sentiment uh, standpoint to keep an eye on them. So two things that I think are really important for equity market, keep an eye on Zoom. If it can't recover, 
um, you know, down 30% from those recent highs. I think that really speaks to kind of like really high valuation speculation. And then the other one is Tesla. Nobody in a million years thought that Tesla would have a market cap north of $500 billion um, as we headed into a pandemic, you know, 10 months ago or something like that. Let's see how that stock trades into its S&P ad. I think that could be really important for the direction of the market into January. Guy, give us your take and wrap, wrap us up. Take us out, my man. So, you, you know, you touched on something that's important because, again, people are trading these markets. And I try not to be dogmatic in my views. But, you know, regardless of you know how hard you try, you know, some biases are going to come in. I totally understand that. And again, I've said this on this podcast. I've said it on our show, Fast Money. I'm sort of always the half empty person, right? I was born into Wall Street. What can go wrong will go wrong. So almost by definition, you know, I'm looking for what's the next shoes that are going to drop. So just understand that. But what I also say is this, and something I've learned the hard way, trade the markets that are in front of you, not the ones that you want. And Dan just illustrated it perfectly. You know, here's the markets that we have. And a lot of asset, uh, a lot of asset groups have gone up parabolically over the last, forget about the last month, since basically March. But be aware of what's going on out there because beneath the surface, the structure, the foundation of these markets, in my opinion, is not sound. Look to the U.S. dollar for guidance on that. And this VIX at 20, I think, is a huge tell. Um, but I think, and I'm, I'm actually pretty steadfast in this belief. We're going to go back and look at December 1st, which is obviously today, for a number of different reasons as, okay, this was a day where something changed in the market. And again, there's a lot of real estate left in the day, a lot of real estate left in the month. But this is one of those things you bookmark. So take a look at all the levels that we brought up today, folks, and good luck with your trading. But Dan, half, like that this half hour ago. So I want to thank At Risk Reversal. And I want to thank, obviously, our presenting sponsor, Nadex, the leading U.S. exchange for binary options, call spreads. And what else, Dan? Knockouts, yes, you talked guy. about it. Knockouts. I love those <laughs> knockouts. Thanks, Dan. I'll talk to you again soon. See ya.